I want to again say hello and welcome to everybody, including those who are watching this over our YouTube channel of The Journey Church, and as we today are going to have a message on mothers. And again, I want to just say a special shout out to our Journey Home Group in Labrador City, Ty and Amanda, Dun uh, Ty and Amanda Dunham are leading. So I want to say hi, Ty and Amanda, as uh, you join us in this worship service via YouTube. Now again, um, today, like I said, I want to talk about mothers, but I want to start off actually by just reflecting for a moment about what took place on Friday. I, I was celebrating the fact that we had this great event at, called LeaderCast. Um, actually, it's uh, an event that is um, broadcast out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, it was actually started by John Maxwell, and over 750 locations host this event around the world. And we're one of those 750 locations. And somewhere between 120 to 150,000 people attend all those 750 locations. Now, we're, what we're excited about is of that 150,000, well, we could say nearly 500 of them came out of Moncton. And I'm always a little proud, I, I, I got to admit, let me just do my little brag moment on Journey Church, but we're the largest host site in Canada. And I just think that that's kind of neat. And uh, yeah, we ought to say thanks again to Rochelle and Heather and to the team for making all that happen. And uh, I always think about what Todd Heisey, our, our worship media uh, pastor or leader here at the Journey Church, freaks out about. He says, I don't sleep well the night before. Because all that work, all that planning, selling all those tickets, getting all the volunteers together, getting all the three uh, uh, theaters all set up for this event. And it all comes down to this. We have a little wire being fed into a computer. And if something went wrong with that wire, oh boy. Oh, it all comes down to a little wire. Anyway, he says, don't think about it too long, Dave. Now, here's the neat thing. This year, every year, this leader cast thing has what is called a, a, a sort of a theme. And this year, they wanted to talk about teaching leaders, business leaders, to be courageous. And so they entitled this uh, event called The Brave Ones. They called it The Brave Ones. And actually, I went on their website, and this is part of the write-up they had for The Brave Ones. I, I love their sort of their very, um, you know, dramatic language here. They go, The Brave Ones have existed throughout history. Some are unforgettable icons. Other names will never be remembered. They exist across all industries, all societies, and at every level of leadership. Join us at LeaderCast Live 2015 as we explore the brave ones and learn what it means to lead in such a way that creates bold cultures, builds faithful employees, and produces high employment. Wow, I go, wow, that's, that's really good. And uh, they really had some impressive uh, speakers to talk about the brave ones. They actually had Malala. Anyone know who Malala is? Uh, this is, you're up on your world events. Malala was that teenage girl who was shot in the head in Pakistan by the Taliban because she was a girl and she wanted to pursue her education. And, and the thing was, she continues to advocate, advocate for girls' education in these countries that suppress girls. And uh, her, and, you know, she really brave. She, beca she received the Nobel Laureate Prize, by the way, Peace Prize. So it was really, really quite exciting. She was one of the speakers. And then for all of you football crazy people, Peyton Manning, Peyton Manning spoke as well. And uh, it was funny. I, I had someone in our church family here come up, and she was at the event. She goes, who's Peyton Manning? <laughs> I said, don't say that <laughs> around certain people, okay? You know, we think about, you know, these people. But here's the thing. As I think about all these brave ones, one group of people that I thought they completely overlooked when I was thinking about this group called the brave ones. You know who they are? Mothers. I think mothers are the brave ones. The longer I live, and when I look at what um, mothers have to be and what mothers have to do, what mothers have to go through to even become a mother, Beth, God bless you. <laughs> um, what? <laughs> oh man, I gotta, I gotta rein it in right now. But the point is, what mothers have to be and do over once this journey starts, it's wild, right? 
And, and, and I'm looking at mothers who are more seasoned, and they're all smiling and smirking and laughing, and they know it's quite a journey because, because it never ends, right? You move from being a mother and then to a grandmother to a... I mean, we've got Florence here, you know, the all-time record holder. She's the oldest grand... Great, she's a great-grandmother. Are you not a great-great-grandmother, are you? Your great-grandmother. You get your great-great? Oh, my goodness. She's great-great-grandmother. Oh, like, okay, we just got to give her a hand for that, okay? Oh, I, I mean, I'm sorry. That's just wild. So, so here's the thing. Here's the thing is that I really believe, though, that mothers, they're the brave ones that we need to talk about today. So that's why I entitled the message today, Mothers, the Brave Ones. Um, but what I want us to do is take the next few minutes and look at what I call a brave mother in the Bible. And um, I really believe that when we look at her story, we start to understand that being a mother is not for the faint of heart. It requires unyielding effort and the willingness to err it requires boldness. It requires tough decisions that at times are risky and heart-wrenching. It requires choices that require courage. Now, I do need to give credit to Mark Mitchell. He is a pastor of Central Peninsula Church in Foster City, California, who, I, as I was doing my research on mothers, I came across this um, material that he had produced, uh, a message he had done, actually, about this mother, and I said, oh my goodness, I would have missed this, and, and so he put me on to, to something I, ha I would have missed on the first glance going through the Bible. So this is a story who's mentioned only a few times in Scripture, yet despite her low profile, she provides a study in courageous faith. In fact, she even makes it, if you know your Bible well, um, there's a chapter in Hebrews 11 that's called the Hall of Fame of Faith, where it talks about what faith is, and then the writer starts to mention all these people throughout biblical history about here are examples of great faith. And she actually makes this list of great examples of faith. Now, um, her name, and, and we're going to learn a Hebrew name now, her name is Jochebed, Jochebed, and she is the mother of Moses. She's the mother of Moses. So if you're having a little biblical trivia moment and you're saying, do you know the name of the mother of Moses? Well, it's Jochebed, okay? Jochebed. Now, what I'd like to do is introduce you to her story by turning to God's word. And we're going to, first of all, uh, turn to Exodus chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 to 10. And if you have your Bibles or you have your smart device, you can go onto our YouVersion app and follow along, or you can just read along from the screen, and here we go. About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married, and the woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. Apparently, he wasn't colicky. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyr papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds al along the bank of the Nile River. The baby sister then stood at a distance, watching to see what would happen to him. Soon, Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. And when the princess opened it, she saw the baby, and the little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. And then the baby sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. And so the woman took her, her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, the mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained I lifted him out of the water. Actually, Moses is a Hebrew name for, means lifted out. It's, it's, it's amazing. Sometimes we think these names are so mysterious, and it just means lifted out. So, now, let's, let's introduce ourselves to who this mother was. You turn to Numbers, tap, chapter 26, and just verse 39. This is what we read. And Aram's wife was named Jochebed. She also was a descendant of Levi born among the Levites in the land of Egypt. Aram and Jochebed became the parents of Aaron, 
Moses, and their sister, Miriam. And now we're going to turn to Hebrews 11.23, and just let's read for a moment great examples of faith. And listen how she gets mentioned here. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid. And I want you to catch that. Because of their faith, they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. You know, as we are introduced to the mother of Moses, Jochebed, we have to ask ourselves, what can we learn from her? You know, you have to understand, when you read this, this story about um, Jochebed putting Moses in a basket along the Nile River, you've got to say, what was all that about? And so let's just get a little wider context for a moment. You have to understand that the Hebrew people who would become the nation of Israel had been in Egypt for almost 400 years. They grew and prospered there, but before long, they became a threat to the reigning Pharaoh. So Pharaoh forced them into slavery. He oppressed them. And by the sweat of their brow, cities like Pithom and Ramses were built. He hoped to break their backs. But the Hebrew people were loved by God because God had promised to be with them, and they continued to grow and prosper. So Pharaoh turned the heat up a little more. He commanded all the Hebrew midwives to murder the newborn sons of the Hebrew women as they were given birth. But what we learn from scriptures is that it says that the Hebrew midwives feared God more than they feared man, and they refused to do it. So he then tried another approach. He instructed all the people in Egypt, if you were a natural-born Egyptian... And if you saw a little baby Hebrew boy being born or walking around, so to speak, or being carried by a mother, you were given the right to see that that baby boy was thrown into the Nile River and fed to the crocodiles. Now, that's horrific. We can't understand living in a culture like that. But I would suggest to you right now, go to Aleppo in Syria, and you're being introduced to a culture like that. I would suggest to you to go to the Democratic Republic of Congo and you would see horrors like that still taking place today where there is brutality and ruthlessness happening in our world. This is not just in Bible times. This happens today. And mothers today have to still navigate horrific times like this. Now you have to understand it was during this reign of terror that Jochebed and Amram, her husband, were now expecting their third child. They had already had one boy, Aaron, and a sister, Miriam. But this edict by Pharaoh had just come out recently. So the only one they were afraid for was this third child that was going to be born. And here, we ask ourselves, what would it be like right now to be that mother, to be Jacobin? Can you imagine living in such fear? As I said, today, mothers today still have to live in that type of fear. You know, I, I went on the World Vision website and I was thinking about why do we sponsor children? And if you haven't sponsored a child yet, let me, let me just kind of poke you just a little bit, okay? Why do you sponsor children? One way to think about sponsoring children is this. We are partnering with mothers who desperately need help. Do you realize that on this Mother's Day alone, on this Mother's Day alone, 18,000 mothers, babies, and young children around the world will die because they don't simply have the simplest things. Medication so they don't have diarrhea, clean drinking water, access to some basic food materials. 18,000 will die today on Mother's Day. And why do we encourage people to sponsor children? Why do we say, of all the things that you budget in your monthly expenses, why is it worth maybe giving up a few extra Tim Hortons? Because you're saving children's lives. So let me encourage you, sponsor a child. You know, I think of mothers in parts of Africa who also face the terror of once they have a son, they know it's likely that within the next 10 years, that child could be abducted to become a child soldier. They know that if they have a daughter, that child could likely be abducted and forced into a, a radical Islamic marriage. That's what mothers are facing around the world. But let's talk about you moms right here today in this culture. Though no one threatens to steal or kill your babies, 
there are forces at work which threaten to drown your children. You know, kids might drown in the river of violence and promiscuity that is pouring out of social media every day. I was talking to Jen, our next-gen pastor, and she was talking about, she says, it isn't your TV sets you have to worry about. She says, it's Tumblr and Instagram. You know, it's all those ones that you have to think about because it's through those social media devices and platforms that right now kids as young as 8 and 9 are getting exposed to pornography and to everything else. You know, they can also drown in a sea of confusion as the lines between right and wrong are blurred in our society. They can drown in a competitive culture that rewards performance over character. As long as you win, that's all that matters. As long as you make it, as long as you get ahead to the next level, regardless of what you're becoming, the question is not asked. Every Christian parent here today should know how dangerous it is for the souls of your children in our culture. You know, in this dangerous world, that's what Jacob found herself standing out in. But she decided she had to act courageously. She had to save her child. And, and today, I just want to take the next few minutes and say, what does this mother of Moses, Jacob teach us? And you know what Jacob teaches us? She teaches us that mothers of faith act courageously. Mothers of faith will always act courageously. So let's, um, let's talk about that. You know, what does it mean to act courageously when you have faith in God? I, I love this, 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 the reason why, why Jacob um, made the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews. It says, by faith, they decided to disobey the king's command, or Pharaoh's edict, to have their boy thrown into the, to the Nile River. They refused to obey that. And they said, I don't care what's going to happen. We're not going to obey that. And I can't admit, um, I think about the challenge that Jacob had faced. I mean, what would it be like for you trying to hide your, three, uh, you know, your newborn baby for three months from prying eyes? That would be challenging. That would take courage. But somehow Jacob succeeded in hiding, hiding Moses. And, and I want you to understand something, that that if we're going to have courageous faith, moms, it means then that you're going to have to be willing to do some risky things like Jacob did. She did something risky. She went against Pharaoh. She was willing to go uh, against what culture was telling her to do. You know, I think about some of the risky things you mothers today are called to do if you're going to live out a courageous faith. I think of mothers who've been unable to conceive but have seen that as an opportunity to adopt children who might otherwise have spent their lives maybe in a foster home, but never really being, a, never experiencing a parent's love. I, 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 that's a courageous act of faith. I think of mothers who are married to unbelieving husbands, but they say, husbands, I'm going to expose my children to the truth of God's word and to faith, regardless of what you choose to believe or not believe. I think of mothers who stand up to a teenage son or daughter, and they say no, even though according to their teenage son and daughter, Every other mother is saying yes. I think of mothers who choose to give up a lucrative career during those prime child-raising time of their life so that they can be with their children and nurture them. And they simplify their life rather than enjoying maybe the, 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 the benefits that would come from more income. And those mothers are acting courageously. Um, what risky thing, mom, is God calling you to do right now if you're going to live with a courageous faith? You know, when we think about mothers of faith act courageously, I also think that it means that you have to be willing to act. You, you know, one of the things that, that I, I think is a misunderstanding when it comes to Christian faith is, you know, we can sometimes become too passive in our faith. We can say, you know, I'm just going to let go and let God. I'm just going to float along the river of life. Just let it be. And I don't believe that's what God calls us to do. I believe when you follow God in faith, God is going to call you to action. And this story of, of, of Moses' mother teaches us that. Because we learn here that after three months of hiding her baby, she knew she had to do something. She just couldn't stay passive. She saw the handwriting on the wall. 
She, in fact, made a, a, a little wicker basket we read here. She covered it with tar and with pitch to make it float, and she put it in the reeds of the banks of the Nile River. It's interesting, when you study the word basket in the original Hebrew here, the word is actually can be translated ark. And it's the same word that when you go back and read Noah's story about the ark, it's the same identical word. So when Noah put his family in the ark, and now Moses' mother puts Moses in the ark. And we think of ourselves, here was this little ark in the reeds on the Nile River. And again, I just want to stress to you, you know what was in the Nile River? Crocodiles. And here, Moses' mother said, I'm placing him in a river filled with crocodiles. Now, I noticed she'd put him, she didn't put him right down the middle of the river. She didn't say, hey, Moses, God bless you. See ya. Hope you make it. Woo! No, she put him among the reeds because she knew that, that as she acted out in faith in this moment, trusting God, she realized, if I put him among the reeds, this is where often women would congregate. And then she had Moses' older sister stand at a distance to find out what would happen because Jacob again knew that if she was following the basket, then everyone would know that, well, this is likely the mother. Moses' sister made a good spy. And when Moses um, was discovered in the Nile, of course, his sister offered to find a Hebrew woman to nurse him, and the plan fell into place. Now, here's what I want to stress to you as you try to live out a courageous faith and you try to say, what do you want me to do, Lord? You need to, at times, be willing to improvise. You need, at times, to be creative. You know, speaking of how women can be creative, I came across this sort of cute story, but it's kind of a fun one. Um, Apparently, this one woman, at the beginning of her daughter's wedding ceremony, you know, a lot of moms come up and they light the candles, right? They, they do, the mothers light the candles. Apparently, she's not, she didn't realize the potential hazard, but she got too close to the flame of the central candle and lit her acrylic nail on fire. So her nail is on fire, but she didn't want to ruin her daughter's wedding right at the very beginning because all the eyes are on her, so she just calmly lit the candle with her fingernail, and then like a six-gun shooter, blew it up. <laughs> Needless to say, her blackened nail was the talk of the reception. Now, 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 my point is this. That's a funny story of what I would call creative improvisation. But, but what I want to challenge you is this. If you're going to have a faith that acts courageously, it means that at times you just got to get creative and improvise on the spot. You've got to kind of figure out, how do I live out my faith, God, in this moment, among my children, among my children's children, among my family, among the people who need my mothering presence, my influence as a woman in this world? How do I creatively move on that moment? Because you know what's at stake. And I can't help but think to myself, what kind of ark are you going to build for your children? You know, I think of mothers who've chosen to give up their child for adoption because they knew that was the best thing for their child. That was the safest ark to place them in. And that requires enormous faith and a fierce love to do something like that. I also, though, think of mothers who would love to be stay-at-home moms, but the family finances simply won't allow it. So they figure out, they improvise, they get creative so that their children are still nurtured in faith. They still build the ark. Now, I'm trying to get you moms to realize this. The challenge today is be a Jacobed. Be Jacobed. Be, be, a, be like Moses' mother. Act courageously with your faith. But here's, I want to give you hope as you think about saying, but Dave, there's such challenges I have in my own life. Faith that acts courageously, though, depends totally on the faithfulness of God. It's not all up to you. You know what I love about this story about, about Jacob placing Moses in that basket among the reeds and seeing how it all worked out? It, it's interesting that God is never mentioned directly in this portion of the story. He's never mentioned directly. I mean, all we read about is that, um, you know, the, the, the basket's made with the tar and the pitch. Um, 
And then it says that the princess of Pharaoh sees the basket among the reeds. The child happens to be crying just at the right time. Um, the sister just happens to be there at the right time to have the conversation so that then the mother can become the wet nurse so that she can be paid for it and she can nurture her child during those prime years of his life before he's then sent off to Pharaoh's court. It just happened to all work out so that here Moses would be able to learn from his mother about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then as Moses would go on, he would learn from Pharaoh's courts all about mathematics and hieroglyphics and, and rhetoric and the, even the art of war. And then this Moses later on would be the chosen deliverer for the people, the Hebrew people out of the land of Egypt, and he would lead two million people to the promised land. It just all sort of worked out. Isn't that amazing? Now my question is this, do you see God at work in the midst of that story? I mean, he's never mentioned directly in this moment, but he's at work. And that's the point, moms. If you're going to act courageously, you can only act courageously in your faith when you are totally depending on God's faithfulness. You know, I think one of the hardest things to do that moms have to do is to say, God, what is it that you're asking me to do? I'll build the little arcs that I need to build. I'll be the influence. I'll protect and guide as much as I can. But ultimately, God, I have to at some point release that child, and it, it's in your hands. That's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? Letting go. I mean, I think about moms who are so excited when their little baby finally takes what? The first step. But here's the hard news, right, moms? Once they take the first step, they take the next step, and the next step, and the next step, and what's happening, and they're walking away from you. And you may want to, just a word to you helicopter moms, you may want to chase them, but at some point they start to run, <laughs> and you can't catch up with them. Because they have to. They, that's, the way, that's the way it is, right? You have to let them go. You know, letting, letting your child make mistakes, letting your teenager or young adult child learn some things the hard way, letting your adult child follow God's call even if it means he or she chooses to walk the other way. But moms, here's the thing. Will you still have courageous faith? Will you say, God, I'm going to act courageously. I'm going to do what I can. But God, I know ultimately you're working behind the scenes to accomplish your purpose in my children's lives. And God will use you. But you have to remember it's not all up to you. So I just want to end today by reminding you, moms, be, be Jacobed. Be, the, be like the mother of Moses where you say, I want to have a faith, God, that lets me act courageously. Um, here's my prayer for you moms today. I pray that God will give you all, all a deep abiding faith that acts courageously because you're totally depending on the faithfulness of God. Mothers, I pray that you'll point your children to the ark of Jesus. Only in him will their souls find safe passage in this world and in the one to come. And, and moms, I pray that whatever arcs of faith you build for them, you'll cover it with the tar of tenderness in the pitch of prayer. Moms, I pray that your courageous faith will inspire in your children and in your children's children and in your children's children's children a desire for, a knowledge of, a faith in, and a love for this God who sees and knows your child's deepest need of salvation and has decisively moved to accomplish it through the work of Jesus. And moms, as your children and your children's children make it through the weeds and the reeds of this world, don't worry. It's not all up to you. God is partnering with you. God is at work. And it's because of your faith in God we can call you today the brave ones. Let's pray. Lord, I would just ask that today you would help every mom here to understand that when we have faith in you, you call us to act courageously. No, Lord, 
this prayer is not just for mothers, it's for all of us. But on this Mother's Day weekend, we do pray that moms will be the brave ones. They will love you deeply, and Lord, they will act courageously in that faith to influence and to change lives around them. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. And we want you to now stand for our closing benediction, and we're going to release you into a week of service. Lord, we just ask that um, the love of God, um, the very peace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all.